Good morning and welcome to the third in a series of distinguished speakers that CREATE has put on for the community at large that is interested in terrorism. One of the things that drives the work at CREATE and has made us successful is the relationships that we've been able to establish with local agencies such as LAX, the Harbor, the Police Department, with California agencies, as well as with our national uh, agencies, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and their components uh, such as the Coast Guard, uh, TSA, and so forth. CREATE was the first national center of excellence stood up by the Department of Homeland Security, and it is sponsored by the School of Planning, Policy, and Development, and the Viterbi School of Engineering here at USC. They provide support and are responsible for uh, this presentation today. Uh, before we go on, I want to show you just a real short uh, three-minute video about CREATE for those of you that have, uh, are, are not familiar with uh, what we do. Uh, CREATE stands for the Center for Risk, Economic, Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events. At the CREATE Center in California, researchers help DHS understand what it costs to prevent terrorism and what it costs to ignore it. Their goal? Identify which countermeasures will save the most dollars and the most lives. Using advanced risk models and analysis tools, CREATE's researchers are examining how to make terrorism less likely and less lethal. Their models and tools draw on three disciplines, risk assessment, economic assessment, and risk management. CREATE researchers were among the first to develop risk assessment models and tools and use them to model natural and man-made disasters. They've adapted these early tools to assess risks and consequences of terrorism and our vulnerabilities to terrorist threats. By basing their assessments on actual risks and consequences, they're helping governments save more lives with fewer dollars. The center staff includes world-class experts in the economic modeling of major disasters, cost-benefit analysis, and understanding how people's economic decisions are affected by the way they perceive risk. These experts model the economic hit that would be borne directly and indirectly by attacks on America's critical infrastructure, including attacks involving weapons of mass destruction. CREATE researchers develop models and tools to manage terrorism's risk, tools to evaluate, implement, and monitor countermeasures, tools that model ways for communities to prevent attacks, withstand attacks, respond, and recover, tools that reveal how a community can make cost-effective investments that will make an attack less likely and less destructive. CREATE has developed educational programs to prepare homeland security leaders for today's threats and tomorrows. The center has provided a research venue to more than 100 research assistants. In two CREATE graduate degree programs offered by the University of Southern California, students can earn a specialization in homeland security analysis, concentrating in risk-based economic analysis. University courses based on CREATE's research have been shared with hundreds of students. Finally, Professional short courses are offered through the Executive Program in Counterterrorism and the Aviation Safety and Security Program. This video was produced by the Department of Homeland Security through their Office of University Programs. That last little bit was on the uh, Executive Program, which we have every summer. It's a one-week long course. Uh, before I became director, I knew I was going to be coming back to USC. I'm an old alum. And I attended the course, and I thought it was just terrific. It's a, it's a really, really good experience. It, it's, a, it's an immersion type of thing where you're in academic lectures in the morning and out in the field in the afternoon. Just a terrific experience. I believe we still have some slots open for this summer. Uh, I'd now like to call up Dean Jack Knott of the School of Planning, Policy, and Development to introduce today's speaker. Jack? Uh, I just uh, wanted to say a word of thanks uh, to Steve Hora for his leadership of the CREATE Center. Uh, he's done a terrific job. The center was recently renewed in its grant from the Department of Homeland Security, and Steve led the team that did that. So uh, he's uh, it's been a great addition to uh, USC and already had a major impact. So thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I also want to uh, emphasize that this is a 
special unique uh, kind of center in that it's a partnership between a policy school and a school of engineering. So it brings uh, public policy, economics, operations research, engineering expertise together to look at terrorism. And I think that's the kind of combination that uh, has allowed uh, CREATE to do very well and for the Department of Homeland Security to support it. And it's been a, a great partnership for us. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure today uh, to introduce Mark Sageman. Um, he's a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security, and the FPRI is a think tank that is really devoted uh, uh, to applying scholarship and knowledge to some of the country's major uh, issues. So it's a think tank very dear to the heart of what a university is about. He's also the founder of Sageman Consulting, so he does a lot of his own uh, work and has his own company in this area. And he's an expert on Al-Qaeda, as well as uh, many other uh, terrorist-related organizations and networks. The thing I found fascinating is he has a, a background, both as an MD, with a concentration in psychiatry, as well as a PhD in sociology, uh, the MD from Harvard and the uh, PhD in psychology from North NYU. Uh, which is, uh, 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 I think, what gives him his special perspective on what he's doing. And his uh, career has also taken him to be an operative with the CIA based in Islamab uh, Islamabad, where he uh, worked with the Mujahideen, uh, as well as work in psychiatry at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's had a lot of background and practice in for forensic uh, psychiatry, including working with convicted murderers. So it's, it brings a very unique perspective to the field. His expertise is really on terrorist organizations, and he has consulted with numerous federal agencies as well as uh, other organizations and lectured at many different universities. Uh, he brings his background to study terrorist networks, um, really who joins them, the kinship roles, friendship, neighborhood, and how cells get formed uh, from the bottom up. And, uh, a few years ago, uh, he sparked a debate uh, nationally about the role of bottom-up neighborhood uh, effects in uh, creating terrorist networks that has uh, today become a very important part of uh, the way we think about terrorism and how our response to it should be. Uh, he also, uh, you know, combining his knowledge of psychiatry and the behavior and the thinking of terrorists uh, with sociology, I think he brings a really unique and special uh, uh, perspective to the study of terrorism. So uh, I think we're in for a treat today, and I'd like to uh, have you join me in welcoming Mark Zayton. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's really an honor. Uh, looking around the room, uh, I hope I won't disappoint you. You seem to know far more about the subject than I do. Uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about uh, today is um, the, the recent trend in this uh, terrorist threat, uh, namely since 9-11, and um, convince you that most of the threat is homegrown. And if it is homegrown, how do then people turn to this form of political violence. So what is the threat? Before we uh, look at the threat itself, uh, we, we actually have to define the scope of what we're talking about. It's not all terrorism. This is the, the type of terrorism that's either Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda affiliates, or in the name of Al-Qaeda. Uh, and so I define what I call global neo-jihadi terrorism. It's global because it goes after the West, and I'm really only interested in the West, as opposed to what's happening in Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on, because I, I think that the data is a little bit different, and the motivation of young people turning to political violence is very different in the, in the civil war as opposed to uh, the West. Uh, I call it neo-jihadi because it is not jihad. Jihad is very much rule governed. It, it's very clear. Uh, but these kids, even though it's not jihad, these kids 
claim they do it in the name of jihad, or they claim that they are jihadis. And uh, so if I didn't use the term jihad, people would not understand what I'm talking about. So that's why I call neo-jihad. It's not because I want to be a pointy head academic, and I know that this is a university. But uh, uh, it, is, it is not jihad, and I really want to stress that. And it is terrorism. So by definition, uh, it, I'm looking at the use of violence by non-state collective actors against non-combatant in the West in pursuit of the global neo-jihad. And before you can start anything, you have to understand what is the scope of what you're talking about? How important is it? And in order to really understand that, you have to count. You have to really do a, a comprehensive survey of all the potential plots and attacks that we have had in the West by this wave of terrorism. And so here, it's since 9-11 in the West, in the name of global neo-jihad, it had to ha have some acts in furtherance. Just talking around the campfire, that would be nice to blow up LA, that doesn't count. You actually have to have done something in furtherance of that. I also eliminate FBI sting operations. Uh, I did that because I am not convinced that those kids would have done anything. There is no doubt that they had intent, but intent is not equivalent with uh, capability of doing things. And in, most, in all sting operation, the weapons and the bomb were uh, provided to, uh, potential, to the accused uh, by the FBI. And I don't, uh, I'm trying to also eliminate all those loners who are mass murderers. And just because they claim to do something in the name of jihad or al-Qaeda does not make them real terrorists. They're just mass murderers. So for me, they had to have some kind of nexus, whether offline or online, to a uh, real terrorist organization. Okay, so that's kind of how I define my problem. And this is what we have. One is 2001, 2002, up to 2011. So this is current as of this morning. Uh, and you can see that there was a peak in 2004. And I think that this was because of our invasion of Iraq. There was a decline. And then there is uh, another upsurge uh, that, you, that we see uh, the last uh, two years. So 59 attacks involving about 210 people, and this is all the West. And so by the West, I mean the United States, Europe, Canada, and Australia. 59 attacks, 210 people. Now, why is that important? Well, we know that the West has about 700 million people. This is a 10-year period. And so we can now generate a base rate. It's a very simple division. So we have three per 100 million per year. This is an extremely, extremely rare occurrence. And just to try to illustrate how rare an occurrence, let's say that I you know, have a test. You know, I take DNA sample and I can recognize a terrorist. Or you know, I have a set of uh, indicators, criteria, that could uh, identify terrorists you know, in, in combination. And let's say that my instrument is so accurate, it's 99.5% accurate. And by that I mean uh, it has 100% sensitivity. That means I capture all, my instrument can capture all the terrorists because I'm trying to, uh, in a sense, bias the instrument for capturing all the terrorists since uh, you know, they can do a great deal of damage. But I, I make one mistake per 100. So it has 99% specificity. That means I have one false positive for 100 people that I investigate. What does that mean? That means that for me, in order to really catch the one true terrorist, I need to investigate, arrest, or whatever, a, a third of a million people, 333,000 people. No one has that type of resources. And most uh, investigation will, of course, result in dead end, tying up all your resources. Uh, 
okay, people tell me, okay, that's not fair, that's not fair. You're looking at the whole population in the West. Let's just count Muslims. All right, so I'm taking a high estimate of Muslims in the West, 25 million. If you just kind of uh, uh, look at Muslims with that type of uh, base rate, you would have to investigate 12,000 Muslims for all true positive, all true terrorists that you identify. And since I kind of, you know, work with the military, even in the military, you'd have to investigate 150 people for each uh, true positive if you just look at the 3,000 uh, Muslims in the army, for instance. So you can see that this is very important because even if people look like they may be, uh, or give signal indicators that they may be terrorists, you, you're still going to have a false positive on your hand. And you have to be able to understand the process so you can triage your resources if you are law enforcement. All right. This does not tell me much about uh, whether the threat is an outside threat, an inside threat, it, do they come from the outside and infiltrate the West and so on. So here I kind of divided uh, uh, the 59 plots into Al-Qaeda plots, Al-Qaeda affiliate, people like uh, uh, Tariq al-Taliban in Pakistan, or Lashkar al Toiba and so on. Uh, people who are not Al-Qaeda but do things on behalf of Al-Qaeda. And the third category would be Al-Qaeda inspired. So not Al-Qaeda, not terrorists, just young kids, homegrown, who want to do things to become famous in the name of Al-Qaeda. So these are all the Al-Qaeda plots of uh, the last 10 years. You can see uh, in 2009 and 2001 we had three plots and uh, then two plots in, in, in uh, 2004, 5, uh, and, and 10. And the, the plots in the middle are mostly British plots. So in 2005 to 2006, the five plots are all in Britain. So if you look at the Al-Qaeda plot, there's 14 Al-Qaeda plots in the West since 9-11. The, the one in 2001, their planning all predated 9-11. So since 9-11, clearly we only have nine. Uh, six in Britain, three in Denmark, and one each in the U.S. and Norway. The U.S. one was, of course, a uh, uh, Zhaji plot, uh, the Colorado guy who went uh, to New York City to try to blow up uh, uh, the subway system. Since 9-11, in the whole West, Al-Qaeda was successful only once. That was a London bombing of 7-7-05. And of all the... Uh, 14 plots, 11 were dependent of grown-up wannabes, and by homegrown, uh, uh, I mean um, people who were raised in the West, who were radicalized in the West, who wanted to do something, and, and then went on to Pakistan to connect to Al-Qaeda to get some training and come back to the, to the West. So only three were outside infiltration. Uh, to uh, the U.S., uh, a Danish case, a British case, and uh, uh, Daniel Coleman Headley, a Chicago case here. Uh, but right now, Al-Qaeda is being decimated uh, in the Afghanistan-Pakistan area, and so let's look at other plots. So the 14 Al-Qaeda. How about the affiliates? These are the affiliate uh, plots uh, in the last 10 years. You can see it's pretty steady, one plot a year, and uh, a slight increase uh, in 2010. So we have eight Al-Qaeda affiliates. Uh, uh, Tawhid well, uh, jihad is the old name of uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. That's Zarqawi's organization before it changed the name and before it became affiliate with Al-Qaeda. Tariq -e Taliban in Pakistan, Lashkar -e Toiba, and IGU Islamic Jihad Union. Of those eight, three are in Germany, three in the U.S., one each in Spain and Australia. And what's kind of uh, surprising is that we don't have uh, any plot from Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb or uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq or even Al-Shabaab, the Somali organization in the West. We have not seen that. That does not mean that we won't see that in the future, but we have not. There are no success. And by success, I mean 
a single uh, casualty, that means anybody who was injured, not just fatality, but injured. Uh, so out of now 14 and 8, you see 22 terrorist plots uh, in the West by terrorist organization, just one success over the past 10 years, the London bombing. Uh, here, most Westerners, uh, they were mostly Westerners, <coughs> wannabes, who linked up to a terrorist organization. And on these three cases of uh, uh, outside infiltration, the two Zarqawi plot in Germany, and the, the, the parcel uh, plot, you remember last year when Al-Qaeda in the Arabic Peninsula sent two, sent two parcels to Chicago. Uh, those were really the only outside uh, uh, penetration. But you have a lot of collaboration now between these groups and, uh, and Al-Qaeda. Okay, the third category, uh, basically the global neo-jihadi terrorism, homegrown plots in the West. And you can see this is, um, this is uh, the graph. Uh, it peaked right after Iraq. So you can see this is really outrage toward the invasion of Iraq uh, with seven plots that year in 2004. And then um, it, it kind of decreased with a slight increase in 2010. Uh, but I distinguished here between lone wolves and uh, a bunch of guys trying to, to do uh, a terrorist uh, plot in the West. And you can see that in the last three years, three and a half years, mostly, mostly lone wolves. Uh, guys like Major Hassan, uh, uh, and, and you have uh, various uh, here. I, I counted uh, the JIS plot here in LA um, in, in, that, uh, in that graph. This is uh, the Torrance plot. Uh, uh, I don't know what JS stands for. Uh, you know, all those guys uh, change names all the time, but that's a Folsom prison to uh, Torrance, California, where uh, you had three guys uh, robbing a gas station to raise money in order to uh, uh, promote uh, terrorist uh, plots uh, against, uh, I think, LAX and Jewish targets in Los Angeles. So 37 plots, about two-thirds of all the plots, those have been fairly successful. There's six successes among them. In Madrid, in the Netherlands, Major Hassan in 2005, this is a Fort Hood massacre. Russian Arab Chowdhury, a young uh, girl who uh, uh, stabbed uh, but did not kill uh, a British member of parliament, uh, uh, Abdul Wahab, who blew himself up but injured two passers-by in Stockholm uh, uh, in December, and uh, Arid uh, Uka, who uh, shot two of our airmen in Frankfurt uh, three weeks ago. So in the U.S., only one uh, case of uh, insider threat, Major Hassan. So in the past three years, mostly lone wolves or duos that constitute more than three-fourths of all the cases in the past three years, They're very responsive to the Internet. And the reason they're successful is that they're very amateurish. They use guns and knives, not explosives. That's why they're successful. Uh, but this shows very much that the threat to the West is mostly homegrown, it's scattered, in a sense, leaderless. Only 10% were pure infiltration to the West from, uh, from the Fatah or Yemen. And, uh, but one third of, uh, the of all the plot, one third of all the plot that had at least one perpetrator, usually the leader who had trained abroad. So you can see it's still very much homegrown. So if it's homegrown, uh, how do people turn terrorist? Nobody's born terrorist, so how does that happen? What is the process? So I'm trying here to generate a model to try to explain this. It's an inductive process, you know, with a lot of interaction between my model and the data. I, you know, but the data, you have to generate a database that's uh, very detailed because I'm trying to understand what's going on in people to really make them turn to violence as opposed to have an incident-based database, which means there's so many plots uh, in this region at this time. That doesn't tell you much about 
how a young kid transformed and turned to violence. Uh, so I usually use a, a lot of trial transcript. That's the core of my database. And I've been collecting uh, the transcripts of most terrorist trials in the West. Uh, I've interviewed a lot of people, police, uh, uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, friends of uh, the, uh, the terrorists themselves, sometimes the families of the terrorists. And I kind of build a model. And uh, I'm trying to understand why of all the groups of people who are part of this uh, community that uh, really talks uh, you know, very violently against the West, terrorism is so rare. So why are specifically these people turning to violence and not other people just like them uh, who, who talk a good game but really don't do anything? You know, most people in police department, they're really interested in the guys who build bomb, go out and, and, and kill. Uh, but they, they, they very much drown in the sea of people uh, making claims that they are terrorists and they pound their chest, especially on the Internet. So I'm kind of looking for potential signatures. Uh, uh, and then I kind of compared those cases to historical cases, the anarchists of 100 years ago, leftists of 40 years ago, cultist terrorists like Am Shinrikyo, and other people in this uh, wave of terror. So this is my model. And you can see very much it's a two-step process. And as you can see now, I am banishing the word radicalization from my vocabulary. Why is that? Because radicalization means two things which confuses and obfuscate things. It confuses because it means the acquisition of extreme ideas. But as I just told you, there are thousands of kids like that and the turn to violence itself, building the bombs. And there are so few of them. And because it's confusing, the word radicalization means both, people use you know, the concept in even the same sentence when they mean killers and, 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 and people who brag and pretend on the internet as the same. They are not the same. And so here I'm going to try to convince you that this process of turning to political violence is a two-step process. One is uh, joining a political protest uh, community, and second, uh, rejecting this political protest community as completely inefficient, uh, pointless, useless, and you have to really kind of take th things into your own hand and go further. And this is driven by moral outrage, the rejection of this uh, protest community, and uh, feeling that it's your personal duty to protect uh, your community, soldier of Allah, uh, as they call themselves. So the word extremism and radicalization and so on really means both. And we have to be very clear and to distinguish those two because that's how the process uh, evolves. You, you join the community and then you reject it and turn to violence. So the point here is that political violence emerged out of specific context. It is a political context. Uh, they do it for political reason. So you get involved in the political protest community, which is still legal in Western liberal democracy, and then you turn to violence, which is always uh, illegal. And I'm trying to focus on this transition from one to two, because that's where most of uh, the bang for your buck is if you're a law enforcement agency. The political protest community is really a discursive community of meaning. It is a community where people talk a lot. They either talk face to face or they talk online. And they talk about you know, themselves and they talk about the political situation. It's anchored by symbols and rituals. It becomes a lifestyle. It's very easy to recognize them. You know, they all wear the, you know, a beard, you know, this kind of long robe. Uh, the women are veiled. Um, they, they also have a lot of rituals about uh, you know, what they eat, a uh, uh, specific way of praying, which is different from uh, the traditional Muslim way of praying. And then when they talk to each other, they all have the same ritualistic expression and references. And these are usually religious, so people mistake people using this kind of vocabulary. This is a jihadi cool vocabulary for religiosity. 
most of those kids turn to religion fairly late in life and pretty recent uh, in terms of the events. They just they discover or rediscover Islam. But it's really kind of a different type of Islam. It is not the Islam of their parents. That they reject. People here in the West know that those kids reject the West uh, for a variety of reasons. But they also reject their parents. They reject their parents as being old-fashioned. They, re they don't want to get married to the old cousin from the old country through arranged marriages. They want to choose themselves. Those kids often meet at universities, at demonstration, and they kind of try to date each other uh, uh, that way. You really find very few arranged marriages, which in these communities are very common, among uh, those young kids who turn to violence or are part of this community. In a way, if you want to think about it, it's a big dating scene. <laughs> and uh, they generate this jihadi cool youth counterculture, and they're very politically active both in terms of demonstration, support, you, you know, but also extremely active on the internet. Being on the internet and participating in political forum is a political activity. If you didn't realize that before, the events of the middle, in the Middle East in the last three or four months should have convinced you that it, they are, it's a very political uh, uh, activity. The, I, you know, people talk about the Al-Qaeda narrative and ideology as if you know, ideas have such power that they brainwash us kids. That is never the case. Kids talk to each other. Kids try to make sense of the world around them. And it's really through those discussion, either online or local neighborhood discussion, using elements of large ideology in capital letters that uh, they're on local ideology. And they're all kind of different from each other. Don't really think there's a uniform ideology. You know, a kid from uh, one street corner may be very different from kids uh, across town. They actually may uh, understand the concept very differently. So they cherry pick relevant elements of popular ideology and they're strongly influenced by current world events and local situation. But it's really those discussion from which um, they try to make sense of the world and uh, their ideas emerge out of those discussions. So it's very much like locally negotiated local ideology which is dynamics and changes with their emotional reaction to what's happening in the world. So it's not frozen, it changes all the time. What kids believe now in 2011 is very different than kids who want to do Al-Qaeda stuff in 1990, for instance. Those were mostly graduate students. You have a gradual uh, decline and degradation of the intellectual level, I would say, of uh, these groups. Um, what is their frame? The, the frame of these guys who are still in this protest community, not yet turning to violence, uh, the, uh, the frame is that being Muslim is personally relevant and significant. This is often triggered by some event in the world where they see Muslim uh, being killed and they say, you know, I'm a Muslim too. It could happen to me. So that kind of becomes relevant to them. Uh, and they feel that Muslims are being unjustly discriminated in the West, persecuted in the Middle East, and by tyrants who are propped up by the West. That is very much the Al-Qaeda narrative. And then further, they believe that collective action can play a key role in diminishing this injustice and can succeed in ending and reducing uh, these injustices. That's what brings them to demonstrate. It's when they don't believe that they can succeed that we become, uh, that we have trouble. And you have a great variation appeal of this frame depending on various national myths. So it's a little bit harder to uh, believe that here in the United States and frankly in Europe. Uh, the state commitments to newcomers, whether they're given partial right or full rights, here in the United States, we usually treat newcomers as potential citizens, so we kind of embrace them uh, pretty early on. This is not the case in Germany. 
where even the fourth generation is treated as Turks. They are not German citizens after four generations in Germany. So you can see that there is very much uh, a variation and also beliefs about opportunity. Uh, if you have uh, equal opportunity, you probably are more apt to uh, accept uh, your, um, your new country uh, as opposed to uh, if you are just a guest worker for a specific reason in the agricultural construction industry and not really given an opportunity to have, for instance, uh, your credential recognized by the uh, uh, receiving country, then you may have trouble. Uh, and also the composition of the Muslim community, the immigrant community. We have usually a middle class Muslim community here. This is not the case in Europe. Local grievances and local reaction to uh, Muslim immigrants are key. So if you have a strong backlash against uh, immigrants as you do in Europe, uh, you may be more in trouble than here in the United States, although in the last two years uh, uh, you have a very strong uh, Islamophobia in this country, which has now kind of generated a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, for us. This political community uh, is very vague, it's very diffuse, it has a per porous, uh, very fuzzy boundary. I call it a blob because it, it's, um, it's so fluid that uh, you know, social network analysis cannot capture it. It really is much more fluid than that. Most people uh, really kind of flirt with the blob, as I call it. So they go to a, on a demonstration invited by friends or relatives, and it's not the cup of tea, so they never demonstrate again. A few that like it uh, keep on doing it, uh, and, and they uh, progress uh, and, and become more committed to uh, the protest community. And you have a diversity of members because anybody can protest, expatriates, uh, uh, homegrown, uh, second generation, uh, you know, rich people, poor people. It is very much a protest community, internally very fluid, and it has several heads. There's no central command and control. You have intense competition among various groups who claim to speak and represent this protest community, but it's just a claim. They don't. They don't have any way of disciplining. And you have a diversity of ideologies, of strategies, of how to diminish injustice and so on, but also you have some very demanding organization within it. The Tablighi Jama'at is Buta here, Al Muhajirun, Mother Brother, uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And those, I say, are very demanding because they demand uh, proselytism 24 7. And if you are part of those organizations and stay there for over six months, you are so dedicated that you just don't have time to do anything else. You don't have time to become a terrorist, for instance, because you are, you are uh, proselytizing all the time. So how do those social blobs form? They create by the intense efforts of uh, uh, individuals, what I call local political entrepreneurs. And you have an escalation in political activism, which is still legitimate within uh, uh, this, uh, this protest community. You, you know, you're invited to participate in a rally or meeting with, by friends or, or relatives. And so, you know, locally you see all of them are very similar. They are either all university students or they're all local street gang members. But when you pull them together, you don't have uh, the same profile. You know, you lose completely uh, in the pulling process. And so some people spend more and more time participating in a variety of activities of protest community. With time, they adopt uh, the activist symbol. They, they start wearing uh, a beard. They start putting the long robe. Uh, women uh, put on veils and becomes a lifestyle, uh, which, of course, is kind of a vicious cycle because a lifestyle supports the political activity, which then, you know, strengthens the lifestyle. We can see how they reinforce each other. And, you know, it goes on to become uh, proselytism all the time and sometimes uh, joining demanding organization. Uh, this worldwide social movement is very much uh, a diaspora phenomenon. Uh, over 90% of uh, a sample that I have almost kind of a thousand people now in it. Uh, 
uh, uh, second or third generation, sometimes young immigrants, and the social bonds between those people uh, preceded any kind of ideological commitment to the movement, but they represent very much a potential pool of disgruntled youth. If that's not complicated enough, now things in the last five years have become even more complicated because of the internet. And now, you know, those kids who used to interact face to face interact online through chat groups. And the reason uh, they uh, uh, went uh, to the internet is that. Uh, uh, for greater pro uh, protection and survivability. You know, once the West started, uh, you know, most law enforcement agencies started cracking down on, on this movement, they, they, they realized that they could talk more freely uh, on the internet, and so they migrated to the internet to have this political discussion, which they, they uh, feared having face-to-face. Uh, -face. And uh, it's really very hard to close down the internet because it's, uh, you know, most people uh, belong to several chat rooms. Uh, and, uh, you know, that both uh, helps diffuse the propaganda, but it also helps the movement survive. If you close down a chat room, it's being reopened by other people in other chat rooms. Also because of greater protection. Um, but uh, the Internet has something really kind of bizarre. Uh, in that... Um, uh, People feel great, uh, you know, that they have a greater sense of intimacy on the internet. It's really hard for an old guy like me to believe, you know, that, you know, to me, intimacy is face to face, you know, I talk and so on. No, no, on the internet, because half of it is your own imagination, uh, you know, you, and, and you're also protected. The other person doesn't really know you. You self disclose. If the other person self disclose, then you can feel you know the person much better. So now, you know, much dating actually is online dating. You know, that's how people meet. It's no longer in my generation. You went to a bar, you like the girl, you know, okay, maybe uh, you'll ask her out. But, you know, now it's all internet. And even if they meet face to face, they think they know the core of the other person much more than the uh, surface attribute. Um, so sometimes it's more open, it's more honest, but also more abusive. But, in the, you know, the Internet uh, also has some kind of um, uh, effect on people with certain personality characteristics. Let's say you're shy. So if you're shy face-to-face, -face, you wouldn't participate. You just stand back, you're a wallflower. Uh, but on the Internet, no, because, uh, you know, all that stuff that inhibits your participation is no, no longer there. And you have people who are extremely shy, but you know, put them behind a keyboard and the keyboard tigers to the point that they become very aggressive. This is almost a revenge of the nerds, if you think about it. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, they become very active and sometimes uh, attain position of leadership. If you kind of look at most people uh, you know, who were arrested on the internet, they were basically nerds, they were geeks. They were geeks. They were not, you know, they were not Lenins out there. And uh, the other aspect of the internet is that it's very egalitarian. So you can't really impose discipline on the internet. The only thing that you can do is just kick people out of the forum. That's it. Uh, so, you know, leaders can suggest things and uh, the initiative is to the followers. Um, it now provides the, the virtual link to this whole social movement, keeping it together. And uh, it's also very much, uh, you can use it now that Al-Qaeda found out that a lot of kids uh, self-organize on the internet, they decide to piggyback and kind of use the internet as uh, the main distribution of propaganda material. Uh, so the self-selection of active participant on the internet really puts a lie of you know, your usual conception of recruitment, brainwashing, and so on, because it's all voluntary. It's self-selective voluntary on the internet. You don't have passive victims, vulnerable, at risk, or brainwash. What you have is kids trying to make sense of their world, constructing meanings from the conversation with peers, making choices accordingly, and of course it transformed the threat. Now, most people on the internet are teenagers, women, and geeks. That's what you see now in 
the last three years uh, uh, in, in the threat. OK. So far, all of this was still legal. So how do people move to making bombs becoming violent? The driver here is something happened that the blob was not able to prevent, like the invasion in Iraq. And remember, the, the, the 2004 spike and 2009 spike was very much that. You know, there was a spike despite the fact that a lot of people were protesting. This is the emotional driver uh, for violence. So this thing happened, and the blob was not be able to prevent it. So now a lot of them are disillusioned with the effectiveness of the blob. But you know, the problem is that they're too involved in the political activism to just abandon political activism. Most people who are disillusioned with something just kind of move on with their life, they abandon it, that's it. But these this people, you know, that has become such an important part of their life that they just cannot give up. They start criticizing blob uh, leaders or uh, uh, religious or, you know, or the leaders, the political leaders of the blob, and they also reject the blob nonviolent tactics. Enough is enough. They feel it's a personal duty to protect their community, this Uma, as they call it. Fard Ain is the notion of personal duty. They often leave the mosque as not being radical enough. They now pray in their own basement or their own living room with close friends who also reject uh, the blob. The ideology changes. The ideology becomes a little bit more violent. Before it was, you know, uh, Muslims were persecuted or, you know, discriminated. Now the West is at war with Islam. That is now the way they conceive of it. Nonviolent protest is completely ineffective. Only violent terrorist operation have a chance to succeed. You know, the nonviolence doesn't succeed. So the first thing is that most people want to go abroad, become foreign fighters, and fight abroad against you know this uh, 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 persecution by the West. Uh, they target the West to expel it from the Middle East, from uh, Muslim land. And then if the West leaves, their strategy would be to use terrorism to trigger a mass uprising that would overthrow the local tyrant. That would be the second phase of their ideology. This is very much the Al-Qaeda narrative or the narrative of uh, everybody else here. So those kids now start thinking of themselves as soldiers protecting the Ummah. SOA, you see that on the business card. That was uh, Major Hassan's business card, SOA. Not Major Hassan U.S. Army, but SOA, Soldier of Allah. That's how he thought of himself. So they do martial activities, uh, uh, paintball, paramilitary activities, you know, practice martial arts. But it's not just, you know, screaming Allahu Akbar and thinking you're Mujahid while you're doing paintball. That is pretense. That is part of the game. It's when this concept persists beyond the game. They still think of themselves as soldiers. And why that's uh, important? Because it legitimizes violence. They think now they're defending their community and they can uh, justify violence against uh, uh, the West. The preference, as I said, is to join uh, uh, a foreign uh, fight uh, whether in Chechnya, Israel, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Somalia. Um, but, uh, so they, they join, you know, they, they travel to the West, but sometimes uh, they turned around and uh, uh, they say, well, you know, wh why are you fighting here? You can actually do much better work uh, at home, at your home. So some of them go back. But it's not really the training that really kind of... Uh, uh, brainwashes them or anything like that. No, no, they're already there. They go there for the purpose of meeting people and fighting. They're already there. They, 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 you know, in training camp, they are not brainwashed or anything like that. And besides, most of the training camps are in broken Urdu or, or pidgin English. It's very hard to brainwash somebody in that type of language. And the training is often about, a, you know, two days, three days to a week. Uh, concentrating on bomb making and so on. So it's not really about that. 
But the training is very important because it reinforces the fact that now they are soldiers. Uh, and, and, and that's really very important. It's not really indoctrination. There's almost none now. It used to be the case that over 10 years ago, there was some indoctrination. I, I haven't seen it anymore. But when they come back, the street cred is now sky high. They are now seen as heroes when they come back. Uh, and so it's very easy for them to invite some of their friends to be part of a conspiracy uh, plot. And once they come back, they hit the ground running. So, you know, from the time they come back to the West, you start the clock ticking, you see that over 50% of the plot reach their completion within two months and 90% within five months. If you're law enforcement, you don't have time to sit on your hands. You really need to really uh, detect them very quickly and uh, uh, infiltrate them or, or kind of stop them. You really don't have much of a window. Now, the emergence of a bunch of guys from the blob, they, as I said, they're not part of this very demanding organization that demand 24-7 uh, of your time because of proselytism. It's really the guys who hung out with people of those organizations. They were peripheral to them. And then you have the emergence of the small active core that becomes a leadership of uh, conspiracy within this discursive forum. It's very much self-selected. You're talking about two to four people. They egg each other on. They reject the blob as being completely ineffective. They initiate and drive the conspiracy themselves. Uh, sometimes you have a catalyst of an inspirational fabulist. What's a fabulist? It's a bullshit artist. It's a guy who claims to have done the jihad but never did. But, you know, how does kids know? They, they, you know, they, they, they can't really call up Osama bin Laden and say, hey, do you know this guy? No. So, you know, they take him at face value. The guy actually tells them about stories of uh, fighting the jihad against the Soviets. Uh, uh, and he articulates a feeling of frustration uh, that those young people feel vis-a-vis -vis the blob. And, it's, and, and those kids really want thrill, they want adventure, they want adrenaline. And so um, they, they go to those meetings and then they kind of meet each other at those meetings and, and then they kind of go to the fabulous, to the bullshit artist and say, can you connect us to Bin Laden? And the guys usually say, you're not ready yet, my son. And okay, so they take that. And then they go back a month later and say, no, ah, you, you're not really ready yet. And then after a while, they realize that this guy will never do it because he doesn't have the connection. So they drop him. And so this bullshit artist, who usually is key in crystallizing uh, the plot, is not part of the plot. He's usually dropped. Uh, but it doesn't matter. The damage is done because the plot has been crystallized and now is moving on despite the fact that uh, they, they dropped this guy. Now, in order to turn violent, to become a terrorist, you need to have the availability to be a terrorist. It's often a time of transition. And when I look at people who turn violent from their friend that hang out with that do not, you realize that the guys who turn violent just hang out with each other all the time. They don't have any structured routine activities. They're students who drop out of school and don't go to classes. They're peddlers who don't sell anything anymore. They're cab drivers who stop driving cabs. And then there are women. The key element here is, uh, the, the key to understand this is that you cannot fight the jihad and your wife at the same time. It is not a fair fight. Your wife will win every single time. Uh, if you marry within the blob, your wife will say, well, what have you done lately? And so, you know, the guy uh, probably will start interacting with other fairly uh, extreme uh, people within the blob, and his uh, uh, turn to violence will be accelerated. But let's assume that you marry outside the blob. First thing your wife is going to do is that, why are you hanging out with those losers? They don't do anything. They just hang out. They don't have a job. They don't have anything. You know, it's, so uh, after a while, you have a choice. You either drop your friends and mean you, you out of the conspiracy, or uh, you drop your wife. You divorce her, and you, you know, go with your friends. But the point is that you can see that it, it holds people back. And you have uh, a continuum of activism, crossing the line to activities. 
So you have this active core. Those are the key guys. You remove them from the network of the conspiracy, there is no conspiracy left. But most people are not like that. Most people just tag along. They're the associate, you know. They're part of the blob, but they are now invited by the active core because they're, they're friends with them to participate. And usually, if, you know, they, and they're invited very late in the conspiracy. You know, if you look at most uh, uh, the plots in, in Britain, it was like two or three weeks before they blow themselves up. You're not talking about a long time here where they are indoctrinated and so on. And usually if their friends who are uh, the active core of the conspiracy invite them, you know, this guy uh, say, uh, I never thought you asked. I know that you guys were doing something important, but, you know, thanks for the trust that you have in me. I, I'm honored to be part of this conspiracy. Uh, but those guys are true killers as well. I mean, don't think that because they tag along, they're not efficient killers. They are. They usually are even more efficient killers than the active core itself. And then you have a large number of peripheral uh, people who know the, now the conspirators, uh, uh, but they don't know everything. They still help them because they're friends. So if those guys say, hey, can I crash at your pad tonight? Yeah, okay, you can stay for three days. Fine, because you're a childhood friend. It's very hard to turn down your friend. Uh, but they don't know everything. So here you have the micro conspiracy, which, uh, you know, all those guys now involved hang out together all the time. They, they think they're special, they're better than their peers in the blob. They are the vanguard of the revolution of jihad. And little by little, the active core separates itself from the blob. You know, they kind of get rid of the non-reliable friends and they are ex a lot of personality conflict. Remember, this is homegrown, it's self-organized, few people with egos, and everybody wants to be the chief. No Indians here. And you can, you can see very much the personality conflict. So, you know, things split and split again and split again, and the guys who are out of the conspiracy are just out. Uh, you have the rapid recruitment of uh, those uh, associates, uh, uh, and again, here is that uh, the blob it creates a, a large pool of people potentially uh, who would uh, uh, agree to be part of the conspiracy if just invited. And here, trust uh, Trump's expertise in bomb making, which is why many of them are in failure. And at the end, all those guys really hang out together. And this is a dual process of isolation because people in the blob now see all those guys hanging out together all the time, you know, whispering to each other, you know, and stop talking when an outside of the conspiracy, an outsider from the conspiracy comes in. Uh, they, they realize something is wrong. But, you know, they really don't want to know because now they're afraid that these guys are going to do something bad and it may, uh, they may actually suffer uh, because they may come under suspicion. So they try to avoid those people and the guys in the conspiracy avoid the guys who are not part of the conspiracy. So you see this dual process of isolation. Now, what about lone wolves? Well, you remember that people turn to violence when they reject the blob as ineffective. And as the blob is shrinking at the end of uh, a wave uh, of terrorism, it becomes uh, less and less effective politically. And so more people get frustrated and decide to turn to violence. So the violence comes out at the tail end of most wave of terrorism. And that was true in the 60s and 70s, actually 70s, 60s, you didn't have as much violence, but you know, the, the, the Bad Meinhof gang, uh, the Weather Underground, all those are 70s organization when uh, the leftist movement was basically disintegrating. Same thing here. And it's not the kind of same conspiracy as you had when the blob was very strong. Those were complex, multi, uh, you know, a lot of people involved. Uh, here you have, you know, maybe you know, it's scattered, guy decided to do something himself because he couldn't find other people uh, to do so. So you can see lone wolves uh, at the end of uh, a social movement. And also the effect of the internet. As I told you, people become keyboard tigers here. And the way it works is that uh, people are shy or are in, uh, 
a very hostile environment, you know, all their friends really don't believe the extreme views that they have. They look for other people like them on the internet. It's actually fairly easy to find. You know, they then uh, integrate in the chat rooms. If they get positive feedback from other participants in the chat room, it validates now their own extreme beliefs. And uh, now those guys kind of feel, okay, I was right, and they start uh, thinking that this is important. They, they, they spend more and more time on the chat room, and the, the, and the participation in the chat room becomes a more important part of their life. They become more confident, more assertive of the online activity and the collective identity. It also now, since everybody can believe the same thing they believe, they think the whole world is far more popular than it is, and of course it hardens their belief as well, this illusion of numbers. And now because they're more assertive, more confident, they're willing to act out. So a shy online participant can become an offline lone wolf. That's very much what we have seen. And now you have a gradual increase in suspicious activity, you have an increased interest in the legitimacy of killing, for all, for only for those with an intellectual bent. Most people don't really ask themselves that question. A few of them do. So you see that. Then increase interest in terrorist activities online, downloading information for skill acquisition, either making a bomb or uh, how some of the previous successful operations were carried out. They discuss ideas or plan about terrorist activities with other people online. Sometimes they practice offline. They communicate in appropriate interest in uh, or casing potential targets. And in terms of finance, it's very simple. Student loans. Most of them student loans. Or loan uh, to improve your apartment or uh, starting new businesses. You don't really see much outside money coming in, even for those groups connected with terrorist organization. And doing a terrorist uh, operation is really not expensive. Acquiring the means of destruction is really the most uh, fundamental challenge as people have. They spend most of their time uh, uh, you know, buying chemicals. They want to do bombs or acquiring weapons. Uh, and uh, once they have the weapons, they're not going to sit on it. Usually, it's a day or two before they actually do the operation. So this is really critical. If they're close to it, they're not, they're not sitting. And if it's a suicide uh, type of operation, then they have a few other rituals, doing the, uh, the suicide video. Those people are not married, get married. And if they have debts to friends, not to the kufr, you know, the infidel uh, government, they don't care about that, they'll never repay. But, but if they had that to friend, they make uh, arrangements to, uh, to repay the debt. Supposedly, you, know, you cannot go to heaven if you have debt. And then when they start shaving their beard, they revert back to uh, a secular appearance. This is hours before the actual operation. So in the 721 case, you know, the failed London bombing in 2005, um, they shave their beard at 9 a.m. and they try to blow themselves up at noon. Three hours. You don't have much time at that point. So the turn to political violence, it's not a linear path. Fits and starts, depending on what's happening in the world, the zigzag pattern of involvement. You know, you're very enthusiastic because of moral outrage of what's happening in the world, and it may fade, and some other thing happened in the world, and you have renewed interest, and you can dust off all your old plan. You can see that the level of commitment, uh, both in terms of individual and the small groups, uh, it varies very much according to what's happening in the world or what's happening locally if the police really beat up on them. It's not deterministic. Very, uh, you know, a lot of chance, meaningful connection. The Madrid bombers were basically clowns, but unfortunately for 191 victims, they found people who were not Muslims who had access to dynamite in, 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 uh, uh, in mines in the north of Spain, and they just exchanged hashish for dynamite. And, uh, uh, and it was dynamite, dead core, detonators, so they had everything. They didn't really have to manufacture something, and 191 people were killed there. Very rare events. Most give up even at the advanced stage of planning. Why do they do that? 
That's because even though they may be enthusiastic at the beginning, they run into so many obstacles uh, and so, ma so much hostility on the part of others that they, you know, their enthusiasm fade and they can't give up. But even if they have the bomb, sometimes they just can't go, you know, to, to almost a precipice and they don't jump. Uh, uh, Sajid Badat, the other shoe bomber, you know, we know about Richard Reed. Well, the two guys trained together. One guy, Richard Reed, decided to do it. Sajid Badat hid the shoes under his bed. I don't know why he never got rid of it. It was there two years later when uh, the police came to arrest him. And of course, he had the shoe. The guy pled guilty. What else can he say, you know? Um, you know, your family is against it, your, your friends are often against it, so you can see why people really give up. Uh, the rare perseverance in the active core in the pursuit of the conspiracy, despite all these difficulties and obstacles, really needs to be explained. That's really the unusual event as opposed to giving up. And here you have a lot of critical turning point, this moral outrage and martial identity and de-escalation. So now that I've scared you, I want to end <laughs> with a happy note in a sense. Are we starting to witness the end of this wave of terrorism? And I think we are. Because a recent event in the Middle East and North Africa, you know, have not undermined the appeal uh, of this form of terrorism. It really kind of displaced it completely. And you can see it, you know. The newspapers have the half dozen guys who go to Pakistan, another half dozen go to Somalia, another half dozen go to Yemen, and you know, we think, oh my God, you know, there's so many of them. Guys, there are hundreds, hundreds of people who have gone to Libya, Americans, pro-democracy. You see the appeal of the pro-democracy, uh, getting rid of Gaddafi, uh, getting rid of Mubarak, it actually has a much stronger appeal for young Muslims here, especially. And it's all unnationalistic. So now you have secular nonviolent pro democracy movements that triggered this mass uprising without terrorism. In, in, you know, this was done through Facebook and Twitter. And they've overthrown two very strong regimes in one month, namely Tunisia and Egypt. The terrorists have never been able to do that in 23 years of trying. They didn't even come close. Not, not, not close at all. I mean, um, and I was, I was in Cairo uh, when uh, the trouble started. Um, complete random event. I wasn't there, you know, trying to do anything. Indeed, I met the leader of, uh, of uh, the demonstration, Wael Ghanim, because uh, I was there on behalf of Google uh, with uh, Jared Cohen, uh, who is a uh, director of Google Idea, and we were trying to, we, we, we were organizing a summit of former terrorists, so we were there to talk to the former terrorists of the Gamma Islamia who had given up violence. This is, you know, uh, former terrorists who have given up violence in order to count uh, um, uh, even the playing field, uh, you know, Google feels a little bit bad that uh, Google is being used by most terrorists in order to case joints. You know, Google Earth is, you know, a fantastic instrument if you're a terrorist. So they want to even out, you know, the playing field. Uh, and so, uh, so we're organizing this. Uh, we came in on, uh, uh, on Thursday morning, 27th of uh, January. Uh, the demonstration started the 25th. That Thursday, it was kind of pretty quiet because everybody was gearing up for Friday after the Juma prayers to, to, to go and demonstrate in Tahrir Square. And so when uh, Wael uh, found out that uh, uh, Jared and I were in Cairo, he basically emailed us and said, ah, want to have a shisha tonight? <laughs> I'm a little old, and Jared comes, hey, it's cool to have a shisha. You know, it's uh, those, uh, those pipes, those water pipes, you know, where you smoke and, uh, and so, you know, what's the best place? Sequoia, which is kind of a nightclub, restaurant, uh, shisha bar, uh, on the bank of the river uh, uh, of the Nile. And so we met Wael. And, you know, Wael is your typical geek. He's about 30, very skinny, you know, uh, about 5'3", five, 5'4", five, 
uh, you know, can grow a real beard. I mean, it's kind of just a little fuzz here. Very dynamic on the internet. It, you know, you know that a guy is a geek when you have dinner with him and you smoke shisha and he has his personal computer. <laughs> you know that there's something there, you know. Uh, Apple computer, I must say. <laughs> Not just any computer, you know, it's the Apple. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, you know, showing us uh, all the stuff that he downloaded uh, on his uh, uh, Facebook page. He's a guy who created a Facebook page called We Are All Khaled Saeed in honor of uh, a young Egyptian uh, geek, I guess, uh, who was killed by the police in Alexandria last summer. And so that Facebook had over like uh, 220 uh, followers. And on that Facebook page, they, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Uh, um, but, you know, I, I'm kind of listening to him smoking. You know, I, I want to make everything clear here. I had the dry cherry. Even though hashish was recommended very highly, oh, this is good hashish here, this is Egypt. <laughs> uh, you know, I had the dry cherry. So anybody here looking at my clearance, you know, I had the dry cherry, guys. <laughs> Hook me up to the polygraph. I had the dry cherries. Uh, anyway, so, you know, this guy, uh, you know, I'm fading in and out because, you know, this is a geek. You know, I'm not talking to Lenin here. This is not, you know, this charismatic guy and so on. Uh, and so he's telling us the fear is gone. Tomorrow is going to be a bloodbath. Uh, he's telling Jared and I not to go uh, to Tahrir Square. And, you know, Jared and I kind of look at each other. <laughs> this guy is a moron. You know, this is history happening right here. And we're going to miss it? No way. Of course, I didn't tell that to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> who actually emailed me and said, uh, don't go. But anyway, a, we did go. We kind of rented a cab the next day. And for three hours, we went all over Cairo uh, talking to all the demonstrations that were converging uh, around 6 PM on Tahrir Square. And you know, I asked Wael, um, how many people do you think will come out tomorrow? I said, you know, in my dreams, maybe 100,000 said, you know, we, we really would be lucky if 30,000 would show up. He had no idea. So, you know, we had no idea. 200,000 showed up. I mean, that's really how, you know, even the leaders had no idea. It was uh, very much. Uh, but I think the government made a lot of mistakes. You know, they closed down the Internet. Uh, they closed down uh, cell phones, they, they closed down. So everybody was in the street to find out, hey, what's going on? And of course, they all went to Terrier Square. I mean, so <laughs> inadvertently, the government uh, really kind of uh, uh, did poorly. And so, you know, uh, whenever I had vision, because I was tear gassed several times, you know, I kind of looked at the crown. And it, yeah, some people had beard, but they were kind of they were young people. Uh, some of them were religious, but uh, they weren't there because of their religion. They were there because they were Egyptian. What I saw was just Egyptian national flags. People were Egyptian. Uh, this is not a religious uh, ceremony. And, and those guys really wanted to get rid of Mubarak, and they're not uh, 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 about to replace Mubarak with uh, religious uh, tyrants, like, uh, like what happened in, in Iran. As a matter of fact, they're very, very negative against the Iranian because you remember the Green uh, Revolution of uh, the summer of 2009 was basically uh, uh, drowned almost in a bloodbath in Tehran. Uh, very against the Iranian, very against uh, that. Um, militant Islam, pretty silent about the demonstration. I think Zawahiri here just kind of uh, released a video uh, and he said, uh, okay, uh, you know, we fought the demonstration because uh, they've gotten rid of uh, uh, the U.S. back tyrants. No, we actually got rid, you know, we didn't back Mubarak on that one. Uh, and, you know, he's kind of telling the crowd, you know, now you have to become religious. And it's like, nah, you know, it, it, it has no traction, I can tell you, to people on Tahrir Square. And, you know, the success of this new uh, secular movement uh, showed the bankruptcy uh, 
uh, of this ideology who, of course, you know, uh, preaches violence in order to trigger a mass uprising to overthrow the government. The mass uprising was there without the violence and we did not back the tyrant. So you can see that this has completely undermined the Al-Qaeda and made it almost irrelevant. What about Libya? You know, Libya, it's violent. Again, I don't see too many uh, organized militants. And I say organized because some of them are militants, but they do it to get rid of Gaddafi. They do it as Libyan. They don't do it because they're religious. And, uh, and indeed, they kind of go out of their way not to really show uh, that some of them are religious and they kind of shave their beard and so on. So I really think that the appeal of this ideology is, is really waning now with the events on the Middle East, but it's going to really trigger a much more turbulent period uh, over there and for us. Uh, but I still think, I'm very optimistic uh, 30 to 40 years from now, I'm pretty pessimistic in the next five years. I think that uh, armies will crack down again and so on, but you know, it doesn't matter. The idea is there, they know that they succeeded, and, and people 10 years from now will remember that they succeeded in 2011, and the base of this idea, they'll go on and kind of, um, and do it again until progressively those countries become more democratic. I think 2011 is a turning point, the same way that uh, 1789 was in Europe, 1848 was in Europe. You know, uh, within three years of 1848, despite all the pro-freedom movement uh, that you had, uh, most tyrants are taken back, but within 50 years, they were all either democracies or constitutional monarchies. <coughs> so I'm very optimistic in the long run. Thank you very much. Doctor, what is your read on uh, the return of uh, uh, Qaladari uh, from Syria to, to Egypt and, and its address before uh, a vast group of, of, of people in, uh, in Cairo uh, representing the Muslim Brotherhood? You mean Karadawi from Qatar? Yeah. Not Syria. Yeah. Uh, Karadawi is um, uh, a preacher usually uh, connected with the Muslim Brotherhood. He's probably the most influential uh, preacher because he's on Al Jazeera uh, weekly, uh, and so he has a very large following. While he came, you know, he was celebrated, but the Muslim Brotherhood is really in, 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 in tremendous, tremendous trouble. Um, the young people, there's a split now between the young people, the 30-year-olds, uh, the guys who did Tahrir Square, and what they call the prison generation. There are about 70 who said, you know, well, you know, we have to uh, be disciplined. We, you know, and the young kids said, you know what? You guys are so out of the time. You know, you're no longer relevant. We are the ones that, that did this, and we actually want for democracy, but we want, you know, uh, uh, our religion private uh, within uh, a democratic frame. And, and, and you see the, the, the very strong split now within the Muslim Brotherhood. It is not, you know, an organization like that can seem formidable when they're out of power because you really don't know how they're going to poll, what they're going to do, it sounds like, uh, and it's also what Mubarak has been exaggerated exaggerating the strength of the Muslim Brotherhood and say, look, you know, if it's not for me, it's going to be all militant. And that's all the tyrant. Gaddafi says the same. I'm fighting Al-Qaeda in Benghazi. There's no Al-Qaeda in Benghazi. Uh, but, so, so you can see that uh, this is one of the major arguments for the tyrants, and, you know, we bought into it. Uh, I, I, I think that the Muslim Brotherhood is probably the most organized political party right now, but it's, it's, it's fading the that prison generation is fading fast. All the energy of those young people, and I'm not really quite sure how this is going to uh, turn out, but I don't see a theocracy in Egypt. Mark. Oh. All right. I'll, I'll just let you go. Okay. You're fine. Just, uh, back to the, the quite right. the, um, statistics that you yes. had at the beginning, right. and it's always nice to see uh, things supported by data, mm -hmm. so I applaud you on that. Um, you mentioned that you excluded FBI sting operations. 
Had you included those statistics, would it have made it much of a difference in your calculations? Well, you would have doubled the risk. Uh, um, but the problem is that, you know, the FBI uses confidential informants that are really very much entrepreneurs and kind of talk to the young kids who are naive into doing something that uh, they, you know, they want to do, but they can't do because they don't know even how to go about building a bomb. And, you know, I can download those videos uh, and, uh, well, I had about three weeks training of making bombs. And despite the three weeks training, you see, I have all my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I decided not to experiment. <laughs> and I knew enough of my limitations uh, that I've, you know, not, not to build the bombs that uh, I've seen demonstrated in front of me with the theory. Well, you know, those kids have a lot of guts, and most of them blow themselves up. As you know, the bombs don't go off. Uh, as I said, it was only that one. Uh, successful uh, operation, 7-7. Seven, seven. Madrid was trivial because that was dynamite that they bought from the miners up north. Um, so, yeah, you just double the statistic, but I don't think it's a fair comparison because, you know, those kids, uh, like the Lodi case, I mean, you could see, you, you, you heard, uh, it was by telephone, this guy's browbeating him, saying, you have to go to the Lashkai toy by camp. I don't want to go. No, you got to go. What are you, a man and a man? You know, it, and, you, and you can see they, they're very much pushed by, by this. So I, I didn't think it was a fair comparison. Yes? Yeah, there was a, a conference here on fake diplomacy. And some of this was derived from there, especially the online and, and the influence of non Hamas. They're Hamas, but they're not really religious ones. But that's out of the State Department. It's also there. And part of the fake diplomacy part of this. How are you looking at? combination between Homeland Security and the State Department, since they're approaching it on that level, with some of the influences of finance. In the 80s, it was cash with students and things like that. How is big money going to influence this? If they're self-financed now on the small end, how is big money going to influence that as it switches kind of jurisdictions? Well, most of those operations are pretty inexpensive. So, you know, what I see is self-finance. So large conspiracies, because those guys don't really work, you know, they hang out together, uh, you know, they have to be perhaps financed for, for, uh, from abroad or through illegal means such as drug trading. Uh, that's what we saw in Madrid, for instance. Uh, but in terms of State Department and Homeland Security, you know, they have absolutely no effect on this you don't really see a single influence from Homeland Security or even State Department in their outreach, public diplomacy, and so on. All that stuff happened, you know, from Tunisians, Egyptians, Libyans, without any, uh, uh, you know, input by State Department. The only input was kind of an inadvertent input, namely the WikiLeaks. You know, the WikiLeaks showed how corrupt the regime was. You know, I usually, you know, I kind of despair when I hear P.J. Crowley, who no longer is a PR guy uh, uh, at State Department or whoever is uh, uh, the PR guy at the White House. You know, they, their statements are so simplistic and moronic that, you know, I kind of, oh, I got my government. But then you read the real cables, what people really think Wow, this is very sophisticated, it's well written, it's really very smart. It renewed my faith in my government, you know, <laughs> <laughs> reading the WikiLeaks. But, you know, they also had a lot of information, namely how corrupt uh, Mubarak was, how corrupt uh, Ben Ali was in Egypt. And this was kind of, it wasn't a trigger, but it certainly played uh, an influence in this uh, uh, Arab Spring, as they now call it. Um, now, the real influence is kind of a military. Unfortunately, it's those uh, extrajudicial killing from drone attacks that we have in the Fatah. That has really hampered Al-Qaeda. It has been, unfortunately, uh, and I say unfortunately because, you know, it's, a, it's a, I would say, an ethical morass, you know, to kind of kill people, targeted killing like that. Uh, but it's really been the most effective thing we've done against the terrorists. So you can see I'm completely split on this issue, you know, with the effectiveness and, you know, the lack of justification. I, I don't think that you can really justify those things, uh, especially when now we target uh, supposedly uh, U.S. citizens as well 
from those extrajudicial clearing. So that has been very effective. That has really hampered uh, Al Qaeda and a lot of those movements. Uh, uh, but what uh, DHS and state have done, uh, not really. I don't see any influence. Uh, let's take one more. Anyone? Randy? Sir, you mentioned the JIS case here in Los Angeles. I'm curious to know where you would see that group on the sliding scale of aspirational to operational. They were sliding very strongly toward the operational side. After all, they were robbing a uh, you know, uh, gas station. Um, can you call them you know, part of this uh, you know, larger movement is Al Qaeda, you know, led by Al Qaeda. That's kind of debatable because, uh, you know, that form of Islam was a very strange form. It was self taught, it, was, uh, uh, it, it wasn't kind of the orthodox type of uh, uh, Islam. But uh, I think that they were getting towards the operational side and indeed they already had committed crimes, which is why it was so easy to prosecute them. So they were not aspirational. I think that those guys were fairly much operational. Do you have a question for me? I'm going to see. Ah. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh my God, it's not a question, it's a weapon. No. <laughs> Are you a terrorist? <laughs> okay, so. First question, can I take that through uh, screening at the airport? <laughs> uh, the previous two speakers, I think were able to be successful getting through LAX, so I think we're okay, especially since uh, we have the federal security director in the audience, so I think we'll be all right. <laughs> okay. That's right. All I right. want a letter from him. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Hora, uh, my director, and, and USC and CREATE, uh, again, thank you for, for making this third uh, Distinguished Speaker Series uh, very memorable. Thank you for your expertise and uh, wisdom here today. And uh, again, we're going thank to give you. you our Distinguished Speakers Award. And Mark, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.